Zinchenko sollicite un relais avec Martino de Garde. Le ballon sur le côté avec un centre et Ketia La réponse d'un leader en confiance, d'un leader obstiné. Arsenal revient déjà un partout et Diez Ketia Bukayo Saka sur le pied gauche, Ouh. Ouh. Saka Bukayo Saka qui attise le feu, le feu de l'Emirates 2-1 pour Arsenal, un tir foudroyant de Bukayo Saka Qui se joue, Trossard, Trossard qui vient vers la surface, Zinchenko en retrait, Zinchenko de garde, oh le ballon est touché par Enketia non. Et Enketia n'est pas hors jeu Qu'est-ce qu'il a fait Arsenal est en train de forcer son destin d'écrire une histoire fabuleuse ils ont le droit de rêver les Gunners ils vont le poursuivre ce rêve 3 buts à 2 Hello and welcome to another Arsecast Extra as always with James from Gunnerblog. James, a very, very goodly morning to you. Oh, goodly morning, Andrew, everybody. How are you, man? How are you today? I'm good. How are you more to the point? Because I sensed a sort of <sighs> manic energy. Is that right? I don't quite know. I watched your On The Whistle video and I, I, I don't think I've ever seen you quite as invested is that the right word i don't know if that is the right word but like just sort of like oh i want this so much oh, because man. i'm like i mean the thing is i guess people don't see me during games but i'm, I'm like that in a lot of games mm. like I, inside the stadium as rational and calm uh, as i can come across uh during that 90 minutes i am uh i'm feeling every every kick of the ball yeah And uh, yesterday was no different. I was going through the ringer, particularly in that last 20 minutes or so. <laughs> But what a explosion of relief came with that winning goal and then the subsequent VAR decision and then full time. I yeah. mean, what an amazing day it was at the Emirates Stadium. And I'm sure felt you know just as good for everyone watching it at home oh yeah i mean it was good i scared uh i scared the dogs at one point um I think yeah was... i mean i scared my i mean my wife watched that video of me in the ground and said she's never seen me that passionate about anything um <laughs> so i don't know what damage i've done to my sort of domestic uh situation yeah But, yeah uh whoa i loved yesterday i loved everything about it and you know a last minute winner in a game of that magnitude against that opponent in the context of this season. Mm. As Mikel Arteta said himself, it really doesn't get much better than that. No, no. It, it's a 3-2 win in a, in a season when you're going for the title. I'll take that every single time. Echoes shades, of David Platt. Shades of 98, perhaps. Yeah. I, I don't quite know if, if that's where we are. But yeah, like you, um, I, I don't know. I felt a sort of weird strange cam in the last 10 minutes mm. which isn't i'm not going to sit here and say yeah i knew we were going to score you know i knew the goal was coming uh, yeah it just was cool as a cat uh, you know i don't know what it was but i think it was the fact that we we had just put so much pressure on them you felt like it was possible because at, at one point on the tv Um, they were saying on Sky, like, oh, what do they do here, these two teams? Like, do you take your point or do you go for the win? And I was thinking, well, there's only one team that's actually going for a win. And actually, there's only one team capable of going for the win in this game. And that was us, you know, yeah. um, United. United signaled their intentions, didn't they, when they brought Fred on, I think. I think so. But, I mean, that was, that was, um, that was after they had let... Bakayo Saka terrorize Luke Shaw mm. and Christian Eriksen for about 70 minutes or whatever it was. I mean, one of the themes of this season has been teams doubling up on Saka. We saw when Newcastle did it, right? 
when we played Newcastle, as soon as Saka got the ball, that one time he went beyond Big Dan Byrne, after that, they had either Joe Willock sitting in or Joe Linton sitting in or, or whatever it was. And United didn't do that at all for probably 70, 75 minutes of this game, which is quite surprising given how, I don't know if obvious is the right word, but like Bakayo Saka is a man who, um, you know, if he tells you I am the danger, you listen, right? Because he is. Um but I, I think you're right to say that that substitution meant that the momentum was was going to stick with us, and um, you know to get there in the end and get over the line in the end, and to 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 score that late winner. Um, I mean, double celebration. Did you have a double celebration? <laughs> I was very, do you know what, uh, as wide as I was, when that ball hit the net, I was a little bit calm because I was reserved. I was worried. Mm. I was looking at the linesman, looking at the referee. Um, and I was kind of asking everyone around me, you know, was it on, was it off? You know, got my phone out, tried to refresh to see if someone who'd seen the TV pictures would be able to tell me if it was onside or mm. off. So the moment when they said, you know, goal good, I guess it was a double celebration. I, I do think it's a shame that VAR kind of robs you of the purity of that one moment because mm. I just don't. I mean, maybe it's a good thing because I just would have fully lost my mind. I'd still be out <laughs> now, probably. Yeah. Well, um, if, if you were following on the live blog, what you would have got was Gapol. That was a, a typo as I was desperately trying to uh, type goal very quickly, followed by Eddie, then Varchek for, on, uh, for offside, followed by I think this is on. Then, oh no, where for a moment I thought it was off. And then, hang on, wait, got to be a goal. Goal! Get the fuck in. So that's how you could have uh, kept over the rest. So I had a double celebration with a typo as well, which is the best, as everyone knows. And uh, yeah, I mean, we were in that ground after full time for for a good while, you know. I, I As you will have maybe seen, I, mm. I spent the stoppage time period basically at pitch side <laughs> um just like uh you know desperate for the whistle to come and everyone stayed in the ground the team sort of did a lap of the pitch and yeah i mean the atmosphere start to finish was incredible yesterday i think i have to start by talking about that because yeah. even before the game you know on the concourses there were pints going up into the air. and That's the always... wrong place for a pint, folks. The pint should go down into your gullet. It turns out that uh, some go in the gullet and some go into the gullet maybe via the ceiling <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, yeah, there were drinks being tossed in the air, chanting, singing. It was raucous and rowdy and a ball hadn't been kicked. And whenever you come into the Emirates and it's like that, and it has been like that mm. several times this season, you know uh, you're in for a treat. And when the game kicked off, I mean, the, the noise uh, throughout the game was extraordinary. And, you know, we'll go through the game in detail, but when we went behind the kind of rallying cry from the crowd and then the explosion of sound when we got the equalising goal, when, you know, Bukai Saka thrashed in that brilliant shot that like honestly there was a I, I can't describe it it was like a, a wall of sound it was like you could feel it mm. and it was spine tingling stuff I mean I, I hope it came across on TV because yeah it was an epic uh experience and the stadium was just completely come to life and it's not overnight it's it's built mm. really i think since the start of last season maybe even since the end of covid but it's the emirates stadium i think has never been like this we we've had this question a bit actually and so i'll just throw it at you from from scott who's at scotty i think it's 818 no it could be s18 scotty s18 i have to find my glasses so i can read that but anyway he said at the final whistle stadium atmosphere was electric as it was all match was this the best since we moved to the Emirates? I've never seen the stadium so full at the end of a match. And I just feel like we keep getting that question mm -hmm. this season because obviously what's happening and, you know, I experienced it with the North London Derby and that was that was amazing as well. But I do think there's something something about a sort of Sunday evening game which lends itself to that something a little bit extra. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, and there's so many ingredients. You know, it's the Sunday evening, like you say. People have been in the pubs before. There's that little bit of pressure, you know, because City are on our tails and we know what's at stake. It's been hyped up in the media. Mm. United are in form. It's an old enemy, an old rivalry. Um, and everyone is just so energised and so invested. And is it the best at Emirates Stadium? Maybe. I mean, we. I don't wish to kind of uh, dismiss a huge period of history between 2006 and 2022 or mm. whenever it was, you know, in terms of the great moments we've had, our Charvin's winner against Barcelona, you know, Thierry Henry. Um, against Leeds, what yeah. Ketia did against Leeds and, and say, sorry, and I actually meant to say that the stoppage time winner against Man United. That was oh, a yeah, great yeah, yeah, moment yeah. as well. Um, but, but honestly, I, this, those are this, moments, aren't they? This feels more consistent. It's much more consistent. And also it is different. Like it is louder. Like people may bristle at this, but I do feel like, I feel a bit like Arsene Wenger built the Emirates stadium and it feels like Mikel Arteta turned the lights on, you know, it, it feels like his team and the connection that exists with these fans right now is what makes the stadium sure. alive. Like it stops it just being this concrete structure that felt a bit unfamiliar, that didn't necessarily always feel like home. You know, people are talking about Highbury. People have always talked about Highbury since we left. Mm -hmm. And it's always been sort of wistful and sad and this thing of this great thing that we lost. And that's true. But now I hear people talk about Highbury saying, this feels like Highbury. And it's suddenly wow, this positive sentiment. Of people being like, this feels like it felt then. Home. That's, Home. Yes, exactly that. Exactly that. And of course that takes time and we shouldn't be surprised that that has taken time. But yeah, it, it was crazy yesterday. I mean, I, I bumped into Ian Stone after the game and he said, he, he really made me laugh. He said, it's the closest he's had to a religious experience. You know, he said, <laughs> uh, I, I'm a, I was a Jewish boy. I went to see the Wailing Wall. I didn't feel what I felt tonight, tonight this mm. afternoon in that stadium. And it is it, it is a question of belief and a question of faith. The, the, there was such a conviction, not just on the pitch, but in the stands about the capability of this team. And to have shared in that was, honestly, like it was a really amazing experience. And, and at full time, I saw multiple uh, people like in tears <laughs> and I know that sounds absurd but <laughs> it was just this outpouring of like emotion and I think maybe some you know grief and bitterness against like things we've experienced against United in the past but people were in bits like it was I had strangers like s s grabbing me just screaming in my face it was uh Electric, uh, the question that we had that you read out, described it as electric. It was that, and you felt it absolutely coursing through you. Perfect. Gotta yeah, love it, that. Was, it was amazing. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, the Arsenal fans who were lucky enough to be there are there in part representing all the others yeah. that weren't. And I know from, you know, messages people have sent me and, and comments that I've had that I think everyone felt, some of that you know i think sure. i think everyone knew the significance of this win and this moment you you mentioned the word conviction which i think is really quite interesting because you know there is a context to all of this mm -hmm. um, that everybody's aware of obviously but you know this is the halfway point of the season this is the best start arsenal have ever had to a league campaign 50 points after 19 games um the pressure that Manchester City applied when they beat Wolves, as we expected them to do, but, you know, it left them just two points behind, albeit we had two games in hand at the start of the game yesterday. But one of the things that this side hasn't done a great deal this season is go behind. Mm -hmm. And what we haven't done 
is go behind in a big game to the best of my recollection anyway. Um, apart from obviously the, the Manchester United oh, game, the, the, the one that yeah. we lost, right? But beyond that, you know, the, the North London derbies that we've played, um, you know, we've gone ahead quickly in quite a lot of the games that we've played. And I think there was a, a sharpness to the way that we came out of the blocks yesterday. I think we, we, we started pretty well. We put a lot of pressure on Manchester United, but then they went ahead. And I'm not saying it was sort of against the run of play because I think it was relatively even in those opening 15, 20, 25 minutes. It was relatively even. I thought we were on top, but United showed a little bit of what they're about, you know, jumping into a goalkeeper to try and cheat a penalty, that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, they did. They did. But they went ahead and they went ahead through a really, really good goal. And I know that... Whenever you concede, you can pick the bones out of it, right? You can do a big inquest and say, well, he should have done better here and he should have done better there and that shouldn't have happened or whatever it might have been. I think there's some of that that might be true um, for Thomas Partey. You know, he usually is a, a bit more secure. But what Rashford did then, the little chop between Partey's legs, the way he took it on and fizzed home that shot. I mean, sometimes you just have to hold your hands up and say... The opposition have scored a really good goal. And I think that was a, a really good goal from a good player in a great run of form. The response then from Arsenal was was quite something. I, I don't know how much of the the replays or or the post game stuff you've been able to watch, but as much as possibly can. Uh, yeah. is the answer. <laughs> so you can see on the TV cameras after the goal goes in, um, and you might have witnessed this live in person and seen it from a better angle or whatever. But you can see Martin Odegaard sort of gesturing to the crowd, you know what I mean? That there's no sense of like, oh, fuck, here we go again. You know, as there would have been in in previous seasons or with previous teams, you're like, oh, we're going to be, oh, okay, fuck. That conviction that this team can respond to pressure, external pressure that Manchester City put on us before the game, the the pressure within the game when Manchester United, they, they put up a little graphic on Sky, actually. You know, when United score first, this is what happens. And I think they win most of the games where they score first. So all, you, you, you have to respond to all of that. But I think there is a belief within the team. There's a belief in the stands, obviously. There's a belief, you know, within the Arsenal fan base itself that this is a team that is capable of responding to setbacks and difficult moments and things which don't quite go your way within games. There have been numerous examples of that this season. I think that, as much as anything, is what is fueling you know, that, that sense, that sort of, uh, that electricity that you talk about within the stadium that, that, you know, we know that they, we know they can do it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I'm, I'm trying to think back now to, uh, what game was it at the start of the se very start of Leicester, the season? When Leicester, when Saliba scored right. the own goal and then... Saliba own goal and, and, uh, yeah, Arsenal just dealt with that superbly. And then even Boxing Day against West Ham, yeah. we fell behind. And the crowd once again just sort of revved up and, and we fought back. And and I, I did actually take note of Martin Odegaard in the middle of the pitch, geeing up the fans, geeing up his teammates. Mm. Um, and it is that question of belief and it was absolutely there. I thought that... Um, in some ways, this match it made me think of a boxing match. Arsenal, in the first two minutes, were really scintillating out the blocks. You know, they were so quick and it was like a, mm. a boxer looking for an early knockout. And then Rashford comes back and, you know, knocks Arsenal down. And you're like, OK, well, this isn't going to be a, a quick and easy fight. It's going to go the distance. It's going to go 12 rounds. And we really knew we were in a game at that point. But mm -hmm. And what a goal, by the way. I agree. Like, a, a good player in the form of his life and you know he strikes the ball beautifully um you can look at arsenal but you have to look at what they did on in that moment too but yeah the, the way we responded to it is so encouraging and that's just one of those things that i can't really remember it's been a long time since there's been that uh unity of a, a conviction to use that word again that okay setbacks happen but we're good enough 
to respond. Yeah, but you know what it is, though. I think I think within the players, within within the playing squad and the team, that there is such belief in what they are doing and what they've been taught, coached, managed, whatever way you want to put it. The organization in terms of our style of play and how we want to play the game, they know that it doesn't matter if you're Man United, it doesn't matter, hopefully, it doesn't matter if you're Manchester City, it doesn't matter who you are, that if we execute what we have been working on on the training ground and all those things, the the sort of the details of Mikel Arteta's football that are so ingrained in these players right now that I think that is almost like... A, a safety net for the confidence of the team. So when something goes wrong, it's not like, oh, now what do we do? It's like, okay, well, that wasn't part of the plan, but let's keep going with the part of the plan that we can control because we know if we do it, we will score or we will cause them problems and and we will force them back. And, um, you know, I think that is a, a huge part of what's happening. Yeah, and I think there's another two layers to that. And one is that I think they play obviously Mikel Artis has a lot of authority but they play without sort of fear of rebuke because they know that if they adhere to the plan if results if they don't get the result mm. and they do what Mikel Arteta asked of them then he will back them and he will defend them and similarly I feel like among the players yeah okay Thomas Partey gives the ball away maybe makes a mistake but there is a real togetherness you know you very rarely see an Arsenal player turn his back on his teammate and throw his hands up and say, mm. you know, what were you doing there? What were you thinking? Remonstrating with each other. It's really pretty unusual. And I feel like when these setbacks happen or when mistakes are made, they're rallying each other. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're really, really supportive. And so the supportive atmosphere that the fans provide is extended among the players. And, that gives you an incredible platform to, to push on from. And Arsenal, you know, came back into the game really strong. And I think the timing of that equaliser yeah. was really important yeah, yeah, to, to yeah. peg United back relatively quickly. Yeah, and look, the you know, the analysis has been done. I'm sure people have seen the post-game stuff. They've seen Match of the Day and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, about how we put the pressure on them to win the corner. Uh, and from there, we we created that goal. But, you know... I'm slightly um, torn is not quite the right word, but you know there's a lot of focus on Juan Bissaka and the fact that he switched off, and there's no question he did. It wasn't great defending by him, but the way that Arsenal fashioned the chance, you have Granite Xhaka overlapping on the left hand side. The quality of Xhaka's ball is unbelievable it's just such yeah. a good cross you know you often see a player in that position he'll fire it in low or he'll fire it in and, and sort of loop it up in the air or, or try and clip it towards the back post but the the pace and the trajectory of that ball makes that one of the simplest goals Eddie will ever score because all he has to do is meet it at the right time and and his movement is so sharp it has been um and we'll obviously talk a bit more about Eddie, I think, as as we go along. But, uh, you know, I, I get it. If you're a United fan, you're looking at the defending. But from an Arsenal perspective, I think the quality of the ball that we put in there and the quality of Eddie's movement um, is to be commended as well. This is not just a defensive mistake. No. And actually, you know, we speak about conviction in the team. We speak about uh, confidence in their game. They took a short corner routine, and I can tell you now, <laughs> a few fans around me, that conviction was slightly shaken. You know, they were a bit <laughs> like, "What are we doing here?" And the way they worked that opportunity for Shaka was brilliant. It is an outstanding cross, as you say. You know, we saw him produce one for Gabriel Jesus. Was it at Brentford earlier in the season? This is a different type of cross, but perfectly weighted towards the far mm. post. And the contact Eddie makes. Some goals are more celebratable than others, I think. And there's something about the delicious, inviting cross mm. and then the perfect timing of that header. It made it extremely celebratable. As soon as he made contact, yeah. you knew it was in. And yeah, I, I think wan does switch off, but credit to Eddie for being a live wire in the six-yard box, which yeah. he, he always has been. Um, 
I think in general, the first half, I mean, it was so fast paced. I don't know how it came across in the ground, but it looked frenetic on mm. TV and in a controlled way. I don't just mean people were running around hel- helter skelter. I think there was such pace and intensity to the game. It felt pretty even at, at half time. And I know that when you look back and you look at the stats and in the end, Arsenal's XG is something like 3.2 to Manchester United's point. Three six, which does tell its own story. You know, I think it was twenty six shots to six. Um, so you know, the, the- I've got to say, you know, and I don't know what if this was your impression, but it uh, it's pure subjectivity, and from my vantage point, it mm. didn't feel as one sided as that uh, in the moment. No. And- no. Inside the stadium. I don't know. I don't know. I don't th- I don't I think that's true. Certainly the first half felt very even. I think as as the second half went on. I think the last half hour the really last, tipped yeah, the scales. It, and I think it really partly did. it's it's the adrenaline and the anxiety and every United attack feels scary in some way, you know, because you know what's at stake. Maybe if maybe that um distorts it a little bit. But because I you know, my certainly I think the first half was much more even yeah Um, and united i thought settled pretty well and threatened occasionally um but the second half from arsenal was really strong and i i think you've got to give michael tessa credit because he did something slightly out of character and made a change at half time that i thought you know probably contributed towards the positive i think that's true um you know ben white has been Unbelievable this season for Arsenal. I think he's been so consistent. He had an off day yesterday, um, picked up a yellow card as well. I mean, if you told me that he was unwell, I would believe that pretty quickly. Uh, He didn't look his normal self, did he, at all in in that first half? No, and and he picked up a booking, and I do think maybe, you know, that that I'm sure would have been a big factor in the change as well. But when you've got five subs, you know, and you've got a player as good as Tommy Asu. Well, that's it. That's it, isn't it? It's not like, oh, you know, with, with all due respect, it's not like, right, I've got to take Ben Wright off, but I've got I've got to put on, you know, Cedric, right? Yeah. It, it's a different it's a different thing when you can put on a player like Tommy Asu, who I think took a few minutes to get into the game. But once he got into the game, like Marcus Rashford, who we, we spoke about in in, uh, in the first half, who scored that great goal, I don't know where he was in that second half. because yeah. He had that one moment, didn't he, where he went down the lane? Yeah, he had the and- shot. I mean, what a save as well from Aaron Ramsdale. Unbelievable save because it took yeah. a deflection. I think it was off Saliba and the way he stuck an arm out. But after that, Rashford was nowhere to be seen. Mm-hmm. You can make the joke about him being in, in Tommy Asu's pocket or whatever, but I just think he was superbly marshaled by Tommy Asu, not to mention the fact that United really couldn't get the uh, the ball forward in any meaningful way because of the the way we control the game, the pressure that we put on them. Um, you know, not just uh, the midfield. I think Odegaard was brilliant, but Partey certainly better in the second half than in the first half. Mm-hmm. Um, Granit Set Xhaka. Halves, I thought, were strong as well. Yeah. You know, against course when they uh, needed to be. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, was it, who was it? Was it on Match of the Day too, where Troy, did he keep calling him Workhorse? Um, I think it might have been. Um, but, you know, Zinchenko, all over the place. I don't know if wow. you know this, but um, uh, I heard this good comparison about Zinchenko and chess. Where, <laughs> but I mean, wasn't that even more true yesterday than it was in the in the um, in the North London derby? He was just—he's unbelievable, unbelievable the way he contributes to this team and its control of games, and and that was something we talked about in in the derby as well. But. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean his his uh, his touch map looks like um, yeah, I don't know, that. a piece I of modern art, you know, as someone sort of splattered uh, art, uh, paint across the canvas, like a it's Jackson just, Pollock. It's it's Jackson Pollock touch map, <laughs> uh, and yeah, it's um, he was everywhere. That's a cliche in football, isn't it? To say oh, he was everywhere, mm. but he well, literally Zinchenko's was. got the touch map to prove it. <laughs> he can back it up. Uh, what were Manchester City thinking? I, I don't know. And, 
you know, I, I, it was quite interesting, wasn't it, to look at this game yesterday and and see Lissandro Martinez playing for Manchester United, a player that that we were after, mm-hmm. um, and trying then to sort of compute what would we be like if we got Lissandro Martinez rather than Alexander Zinchenko. And I think Martinez is a really good player, but I don't think he can do what Zinchenko does. I don't no, think no, he can. I don't think he can. And I, I think, you know, what was really evident, uh, you know, you talk about Odegaard sort of uh, geeing up the fans and mm. asking for more from them. In the second half, Zinchenko was doing that time and time again. And, you know, w- when the game went dead, he would turn to the fans and he would ask for more. Mm. He would turn to his teammates and ask for more. In the in the huddle before the game, you know, it was Zinchenko. Before, while Odegaard yeah, I was saw doing... That. The coin toss and everything, you know, shaking hands with the referee and the opposition captain. Zinchenko was in there doing a lot of the talking. And I think I'm right. He said after the game, he was saying, you know, these are the moments that when we retire, we'll wish we could have again. You know, this kind of very inspirational yeah, yeah, yeah. team talk. He's an, He is a leader. He is a leader. I mean, that captaincy group, Shaka, Jesus, um, and Odegaard, of course, if Zinchenko was introduced to that sometime in the next few months, I would not be in the least surprised. No, no, no. I and mean, the, the, a player who's only been there a matter of months. It's extraordinary. I love the quote after where he's talking about how he knew the players and he said, I started to speak in the dressing room. Guys, forget top three or whatever. We need to think about the title. Some of them were laughing, but no one is laughing now. I mean, that tells you plenty. He knows how to win football matches, that guy. He knows what it takes. And he was up against uh, Anthony on the night, right? and <laughs> who, I mean, is, you know, a disaster of a signing, in my opinion. But it made me think, like, we paid, you know, 30, 35 million for Zinchenko. If he had a Brazilian passport instead of a Ukrainian one, what would he cost how much would that change yeah, 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 the yeah. perception of him because i think actually in terms of that like true brazilian spirit of kind of one on one ability you know i'm going to beat you if you beat me i'm going to come back at you and humiliate you and i've watched him do it to so many people because he's not flawless like he'll make a mistake he might misplace a pass he might dwell on the ball too long mm-hmm. but the next time he gets the ball the intention with which he plays he makes people look silly around him. He makes he make he looks like a grown up playing with kids, but and it, yeah, the areas he's playing in it's so interesting. You know, he's basically we, for years we had Granite Shaka and he was our build up guy on the left hand side, and we knew it was flawed, but it was the best that we had. And now Zinchenko has just assumed all that responsibility. That, and, yeah. Yeah. The last time I saw Anthony in the game was when Zinchenko took a look at him and just decided, right, fuck you. I'm going to roast you here. And he mm. just stepped inside him, drove into midfield. Anthony's chase was sort of half-hearted. And honestly, that's the last time I can remember seeing him until he came off, till yeah. his number went up. He was n- like monstered by Zinchenko. And I think what's really interesting about Zinchenko too is – you know, some of the um, the analysis, and I think it's probably true to an extent, is that like as a left back, maybe defensively, he's not quite as traditionally solid defensively as people would assume a left back to be. But some of the high balls that he won yesterday, <laughs> what, I mean, does he have- Same against Spurs. Spring, a lot yeah. of headers. But like, has he got springs in his boots or something? Because like, he, you see him, oh, here he goes. And then you're like, Jesus- how the fuck has he jumped that high? I He's know. got unbelievable spring in those sort of defensive um, those defensive moments. And I went back to look at the stats and it said he won two aerial balls. I'm thinking, there's one of those where stats definitely don't tell you what I think I saw. Yeah, I think I remember two just in stoppage time, yeah. to be honest with you. Um, yeah, he is. Uh, there are moments where he'll be overly ambitious or he'll be casual. I'm mm. not here to say he's perfect, but I am here to say that he manages to outweigh all those with the positive contribution he makes. And in yeah. that second half, 
he was absolutely one of the driving forces in the team. I think the point you make about Martinez is so interesting. Arsenal Arsenal have got the better end of that deal. They've got the right end of that deal for mm. this team. And that's the thing where sometimes in recruitment, you get a bit of luck or, yeah. you know, something that you were planning on doesn't happen and you go an alternative route, but the chemistry is just right. And he's absolutely one of those. I'd love to know, actually, it'd be a fascinating question to ask Mikel Arteta is to like, what, what did he envisage for Lissandro Martinez? Did he feel like he could coach him into doing what Zinchenko does? Mm. Or is Zinchenko's natural ability in that position? Because, um, you know, uh, Martinez is like a center half who can play at left back and in midfield, whereas Zinchenko is like a playmaker who can play at left back. And so there's a slight variation in their sort of natural position. So I'd love to know whether you know, what Arteta thought of what way his team would look with Martinez. I mean, it's a moot point and I, I suppose we don't really care, but um, it would be fascinating to know uh, at some stage. Um, yeah, I, th I think from what I was told at the time, the plan was to use him, you know, as one of these kind of narrow fullbacks. But mm. I, I imagine that would have been a bit more like Tommy Asu plays on the opposite flank. I don't think he envisaged Sandro Martinez turning up on the sure. right wing uh, as <laughs> Arsenal sure. you know, look for a winner. I mean, Zinchenko, I think he's pretty unique in that respect in terms of how he plays. And it's it's been a huge win for this Arsenal team to, to have him. And yeah, I just look over at Manchester City and think... Thanks. Thanks. And what <laughs> must they think has there has it is it completely unprecedented for a team to sell two players to a club who end up rivaling them for the title the following season i i it mm. i I've, i can't think of any example no. uh, comparable so yeah he he, he was amazing yesterday as, as were many of the players right before we get to the to the winner um let's talk bakayo saka Again, mm -hmm. uh, we did mention him earlier and, and the sort of impact he, he had. But that goal, for all the analysis you want to make, and, and I know Eric Ten Hag afterwards was not happy with the way they defended it, but mm. I can't remember who wrote this. Was it on, could have been on the, the Ars blog forum or was it somewhere in the Discord? And I apologize to whoever um, wrote this this morning, uh, who I can't remember, and all credit to them for this comparison. But he put Saka in the same kind of bracket as Aryan Robin. And I don't mean as a horrible divey prick. I mean the sort of player who everyone knows what they're going to do and how they're going to do it, but they're so good that you can't stop it. Mm -hmm. like Robin, oh, look, he's going to come in on his left foot and fire in a shot, and it's going to be a goal. Right, we know he's going to do that, but we can't actually stop him from doing it. You know, if you just give him that in uh, that little bit of space, he can punish you, and I think Saka's in that bracket now where people kind of know what he's going to do, although I think there's a versatility to Saka that wasn't really there with Robin as much because I think part of why defenders back off is they're not quite sure if he's going to go right foot or left foot. I mean, most of the time he'll go left foot, but he can go outside you as well. He can deliver with his right foot. We saw the danger that he calls with his right foot in the derby, but what an unbelievable goal that was. You know, sort of like... With Rashford, it was like, okay, anything you can do, I'll show you what I can do. And this is fucking my house, by the way. A little copy of the Rashford celebration as well, which was quite funny. Unbelievable goal from Saka. Yeah, probably his best goal for Arsenal, actually. And certainly given the occasion, I think whatever happens in the remainder of the season, we'll be seeing that goal on highlight reels for years and years to come. Mm. Um in some ways, it, it it was a goal that deserved to be the winning goal. I might have been, you know, things turned out slightly differently. But I was where I was sat was kind of directly in line with the shot, so it was flying directly towards me. And yeah, when I saw it, just sort of skip off the ground and go into the corner of the net. Um, precision. It was real precision, and it was bedlam in the stands. I mm. mean, I'm going to say this of Saka and. Please, this is not a um, criticism, but he can do that 
even more often, I think. Like, I think he's got it well within his potential to score those kinds of spectacular goals. He can strike the ball really cleanly. And uh, what's exciting about this to me, obviously it's a brilliant goal, but it's a decisive moment in a huge game. And I just think he's going to continue delivering those. I feel like it's uh, it's like laying down a marker for what more he can do in mm. the game. He absolutely has the talent to decide big games with moments of individual brilliance. He's been doing it, you know, almost since he broke into the team. But I think he can do it in this kind of fashion more frequently going forward. Because as you say, everyone knows what he wants to do. But stopping it is another matter entirely. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, it was a a great, great, great goal, and yeah, I, you know, on a, I think obviously, you know, United came back and got the equaliser fairly quickly. But on another day, would have absolutely fitted settling this tie. It was a sensational strike. Yeah, it really was. Um, we have to discuss their equaliser, I guess. Mm -hmm. A corner. Um, not long after Ramsdale made that save, actually. Um, but I think you will look at that one and say he probably should have punched it. I think he's a little bit unfortunate in that he comes for the ball and it's Tommy Asu who, who is sort of in the way and he he drops it and Martinez. Um, I mean, it's... I don't know if it's a good goal. Does he mean exactly that? I'm not quite sure. Um, I don't but, know if he means it. If he means it, it's a great header. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not, I guess he's just sort of getting it up there and, and hoping for the best. Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, the chances, like it's definitely an error from Ramsdale, no doubt about that. But the chances of it being a goal from that position uh, mm. st are still pretty slim and United, uh, you know, squeak one in. I, I do think it's interesting that it's Tommy Asu. I mean, we've played so many games with the same back four and you do wonder if it's Ben White in that position. Is the communication a bit better? Um because really, Ramsdale's come for it. It's a communication error between them. You know, I, I, one of them needs to take it and the other one not. And they end up sure. getting each other's way. Um, tries to catch it, doesn't. And then Martinez scores. But that was my feeling, you know, is at 2-2, I would have taken a draw before the game. I, I, I thought we could win the game, but I would have accepted a draw because United are a decent team and it's certainly an improving team. And in good form as well. And in really good form. But when you look at the goals, you know, especially the first four goals in the game, Arsenal, Arsenal, Rashford's goal was brilliant, but it did come from an error on our side. Whereas we really, you know, I felt like we had to sort of work we, we had to conjure our goals, whereas I feel like we sort of played our part in theirs, that's, you know? We kind of, yeah. I'm not going to say we gifted it to them, but... That's so interesting because, you know, the analysis that they were doing on, on Sky afterwards and the analysis yeah. that they did on Match of the Day was like, well, look at how Manchester United made mistakes in these areas, and that's why mm. Ten Hag was so angry. But, I, you know, I, I think there's something to that, but I think as well there's... These weren't necessarily unforced errors, if you like. These were a consequence of, I don't even think they were big errors. There were just things that maybe United could have done a little bit better. Yeah, it's but, just but we forced sort of, that. Um, we forced it with the pressure and the way that we played the game in their half. I mean, was it, what's the stat? I think 63 touches in the United box, which is more touches than any team has had in the, in the penalty box of any team so far in the Premier League this season. This isn't... Like, oh, look, United have made a mistake. Let's capitalize on that. We put them under pressure. They didn't deal with things as well as they should, but we still had plenty to do. I think that that takes away from the quality of what we did yesterday and how we scored those goals to just say, well, United made mistakes and they should have done better. Yeah. You know, teams I mean, crumble I, I, I and I wonder crack. if that came from the likes of Gary Neville and Roy Keane. I feels, that feels like a United analysis. And obviously we're sat here doing our Arsenal analysis. Yeah. But it feels like a United analysis to say, oh, look at wan or, you know, should have closed Saka down. Yeah, it's true uh, to an extent, but it, it, it doesn't give sufficient to credit coin, to, to what we did to score those goals. And, and, and their goals, you know, credit to Martins, credit to Rashford, but their goals came from a misplaced pass and a drop catch. Yeah. And I think... I think we 
did more to sort of create our goals than they did theirs. And that's why I think a draw mm -hmm. would have felt a little bit underwhelming. And, and to, to be clear, I made this point in my, in my video after the game, but the party pass that is cut out for the first goal is a similar pass he's attempting to what releases, I think it's Saka in the derby mm -hmm. and we go up the other end and score. It's an it's a ambitious pass round the corner, but a forward-thinking, proactive pass. And similarly with Ramsdale, yeah, he gets in a muddle with Tomiyasu and drops it. But mm -hmm. he's a, he's a forward-thinking, proactive goalkeeper who wants to come and get involved. I mean, De Gea made a good save from Nketiah in this game, but I thought with his feet, really struggled. Um, you know, I don't think he was convincing in any way. And, and what I'm getting at there is that to say you can criticise uh, the action from these players, but I don't think you can criticise the intention. Mm. And that's a really nice thing as an Arsenal fan, because for so long we were looking at teams and thinking, was that a bit of a conservative pass? Did that player abandon his, uh, you know, his marking there? Sure. Did he pull out of that challenge? The mistakes we made in this game came with the best of intentions. And that speaks to the, the way in which this team play and explains why they've been quite so successful this season. I do agree with that. But, uh, you know, I also am aware that part of it is you just trying to cover your arse after saying last week that Ramsdale doesn't make any mistakes. Obviously, that's also quite Clearly. a big in this. <laughs> But no, I think you're right. I think you're right. And, you know, you could hear the way the Arsenal fans were getting on uh, De Gea, as soon as he had the ball at his feet, there was like a, Ooh, and, you know, just trying to put a bit of pressure on him because everyone could recognize the flaw that was there in, in, in his game. Um, mm. So look, we, I, we mentioned already the fact that in the second half, Arsenal's pressure was fairly relentless. There was only one team that looked like it was going to be able to score the winning goal. Yeah. And I think, I think the, the fact United played in midweek, Probably a factor in that as Yes, well. agree, agree. You know, we had a bit more energy about us. But it was not dissimilar to the last 20 minutes or so of the Newcastle game, was it? Where we played most of the game in their half and we were looking for a goal to win the game. The difference this time, of course, is that A, we got the goal, but B, we brought on a substitute to um, give us something a little bit different, something a little bit extra. Leandro Trossard coming on to make his debut and involved in some good moments. I mean, before we talk about the, the goal specifically, I just think I looked at him when he came on and technically he's just absolutely the right fit, isn't he? You know, just what he what he can do on the ball, the security that he gives you when he picks it up in midfield. There were a couple of moments where he turned away from a, a couple of defenders and made a pass. You know, nothing, nothing that you're going to, like, make a T-shirt about. But, you know... It's exactly the way Mikel Arteta wants his teams to play, and and he's just got that technical level to do that. He does. He looks very technically sound, very secure. Mm -hmm. um, I think as well the freshness, yes, but I think it gave the crowd a lift um, and a, a little impetus to just make that bit more noise and mm -hmm. help you know increase the pressure on United. A nice pass, I thought, in the build-up to the goal. You know that sort of yep. uh, Alex Leb, Sami Nasri slide in the fullback. Um, yeah, he he, he 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 had a tidy debut, and but I do think it's just the change of impetus um, that gave us that push. As you say, it was similar to Newcastle, and mm. the difference this time was that we had a change to make. And we had Emil Smith-Rowe as well, who I think we can assume, you know, probably isn't ready uh, in the same way that they deem Trossard ready as someone who's played a lot of Premier League football this season. Yeah. Um, but that was a moment in the game, him coming on. And yeah, the last 20 minutes, you know, I, I make my notes on my phone throughout the game. If I see like, you know, a particular thing and, uh, uh, I've, the last thing I wrote was 64 minutes, Eddie, just wide. Um, and then after that, I've just written in caps, I give up because I was so <laughs> invested in the game at that point. I was like, I need to not write anything down. I'm sure. just going to live this moment to moment. And fortunately, that decision paid off with yeah. 
with the, the glorious finale. Yeah, and Eddie did have a chance before that. I think you mentioned that uh, De Gea made a good save, mm, um, mm. close-range save. It was kind of straight at him, but it was one of those as a striker, you've got to get yourself in the in the right area, get it on target, and you know, um, another day that could have squeezed under the goalkeeper or something else. So Yeah, you know, I, I, saw, I saw people say Eddie should score there, and I'm like, well, it happens very quick. He's on the spin. Yeah. I think uh, sometimes you strike that ball slightly differently, and it... As you say, squirms into the corner. Yeah, you the you keeper. don't you don't um, you don't have a chance to sort of pick your spot. You've just got no. to turn and make sure you it's get reaction. it on target. And actually, it's one of those where perhaps if you miss kick it, you've got a better chance of scoring. Yeah, in a funny way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think you know, as you say, he was in that place at that time. That is the mark of a great goal scorer, and that is what was key to us ultimately winning yeah. the game. Um. We probably have a few questions about Eddie and stuff in the in the second half mm-hmm. uh, because I think his his contribution and his performance merits a, a little bit more discussion. Um, and we sort of talked about the atmosphere and the way things went at the end. So, I mean, is there anything else that you want to bring up before we get into the questions? Um, I mean, the significance of the win is obvious because you know the the Man City game beforehand and the the fact they cut the lead. Um, you know, you, you're reminded quite quickly, aren't you, of how eight points can look actually quite precarious pretty quickly, depending on how fixtures fall or one result or, or whatever it might be. And there's still a long way to go in this season. But the, the fact that we were able to to dig this win out, to dig this three points out, it's the sort of result that you look back on maybe at the end of a, a title winning season. And I'm not getting ahead of myself here by any means. I'm not taking anything for granted or saying this is what's going to happen. But this felt like, you know, on top of what happened last week at White Hart Lane, a really significant week for Arsenal Football Club in this season because there are moments, there are periods in in uh, the season, in the fixture list where you look and you go, oof, you know, would you take a draw at Spurs? Would you take a draw against Manchester United? Mm-hmm. Maybe you would, you know. Um, but to come away from these two games at six points, whew, I mean, it feels significant. It does, definitely. If Arsenal's season ends how we all hope it ends, I think we'll look back on this seven days um, as as a critical moment. Mm. Um but I also think that we mustn't um, we mustn't think too much on May and what may or may not happen in May. I think we also have to really savor and enjoy this moment right now. Sure. And what Arsenal have done by reaching fifty points in nineteen games at the halfway mark of the season that they're, they're on their way to become centurions in the Premier League if they keep up this pace. Wow. Um, it's just extraordinary. And we've waited such a long time. You know, it's two th- it, it, this year's 2023. So this year will be 20 years since the start of the Invincibles season um, when we last won a Premier League title. And... We've waited such a long time to have a team who, you know, make us dream mm. in this fashion. So I, I just, I understand completely the talk about the title. And I think we should believe because I think these players believe and the, the manager believes. And why not buy into that? Why not be part of that journey? Mm. But I think we have to also reflect on that, you know, what Arteta's in the documentary that, the, the the journey um, is as much part of it as anything else. And this is a great, 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 great milestone along that journey. And I think the fact that it was United as well, mm. and they were the only team to have beaten us this season. Yes, that was significant too. Yeah, and I felt like they wanted to put that right, the team. I felt like they were like, we're not going to have that on our record. You know, no. We need to show them. And, and another thing I thought yesterday, in, in the cauldron that was the Emirates Stadium was for weeks now I've heard people say well Arsenal still got to play Manchester City twice and 
what I think more people should be saying is, well, Manchester City have still got to play Arsenal twice. Mm. Manchester City have still got to come to the Emirates Stadium. And yeah, look, they're a team against which we've not had a great record historically, but same has been true of us going to White Hart Lane. Same of us, you know, has been true of other matches, you know, Brighton. Mm. We have put right Crystal a Palace. lot of wrongs this season. Exactly. And I, and you and I, you would have to think in the home game against Manchester City, Arsenal would really fancy themselves. And if they can win that game, mm. they will be making life very, very, very difficult for Pep Guardiola. Fingers crossed. Fingers mm -hmm. crossed. All right. Well, look, I think we should come to the end of part one here because we do have a lot of questions. I do feel like perhaps we could have done a better first half because in the words of a uh, of a wise man you can always get better in life isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you can in always, it really in it. Laugh. just unbelievable so funny all right well look we'll take a break we've got loads of questions to get into on uh, on this particular show so come back to us right after this we'll deal with your questions and more <laughs> Welcome back to the Arscast Extra. This is part two of the show where we answer questions that you sent to us on Twitter at GunnarBlog and at ArsBlog. Also on the ArsBlog Discord chat server, which you get access to if you are an ArsBlog member on Patreon. Can I go first? Be my guest. Okay. This one comes from our Discord and it comes from Kentucky Gooner. Don't know where he's from. Or who he supports, yeah. but... Well, maybe we'll Let's find see. out one day. Yeah. Uh, he says, has any player improved more than Eddie this season? I feel like he's hit another level. Hmm. I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that anyone has improved quite so much. Let, um, let me put the question a different way to you then, with apologies to Kentucky Gooner, or wherever he's from and whoever he supports. Has any player exceeded expectations more yeah. than Eddie this season? Well, that's what I was going to say. I was going to say, has any player, uh, has, has perception of any player changed as dramatically as that of Eddie and Ketia? Because I think that Eddie, in fairness to him, over the last couple of years, has... I mean, the run he had at the end of last season, for example, was very strong and very impressive. But I think as a fan base, we can... And listen, there are exceptions, of course, but mm. I think as, as a collective, if we're generalising, speaking in general terms, we were all very worried when Gabriel Jesus got injured. Yes. And I think justifiably so. And there was a lot of uh, talk about the disparity, the gap between... Jesus and Enketia. And I think you just have to say that he's done superbly well. I mean, he has stepped up to the mark. He's performed in big games. I mean, this run of fixtures has included Newcastle, Spurs, United. He didn't get goals in the first two, but he produced really good team performances. Two goals against Man U. If we had signed a player during the World Cup to come in and replace Jesus and they had performed anything like Nketiah is performing right now, we would be hailing it as the signing of the century. We'd be saying we've pulled off a masterstroke. Mm. And yeah, I think he has been brilliant. That's all I can say. He's been brilliant and he deserves all the credit that he's getting right now because his attitude has been exemplary, he's waited for his chance and he's seized it with both hands. Yeah, I mean, he's always backed himself. Mm -hmm. He's always backed his own ability and I understand and um, I'm sure many people do, you know, why there was a some doubt about that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The player talking himself up, okay, 
but you've got to deliver. You've got to put your money where your mouth is. And he did that podcast last season. Was it the, um, what's the name of the podcast? I want to give them a shout out again. Um, uh, the yeah, beautiful game, awesome was it? Uh, uh, Eddie and Ketia podcast. podcast. Let's have a look. Um, ba, ba, ba. The yeah, beautiful, beautiful game. game. Yeah. Beautiful game. And it was a really good interview by the boys with Eddie. And he was like, well, if you give me a few starts, hand me some starts and I don't score, well, fair enough. Your criticisms are, are yeah. valid, but I need those starts to score. And then he got this run in the team at the end of last season and lo and behold, he scored. And that brought about a new contract and there were eyebrows raised over that new contract. Again, I understand why, you know, a player like Eddie, who's come through the academy, who looked, you know, at various points like he was going to go somewhere else. And there were moments where he could have gone somewhere else. And he gets this contract, which I, you know, again, I don't want to focus too much on the wage, but people, you know, people look at wages and say, that's how you judge the value of a player and everything else. And this season, he's had to sit it out for basically most of the season until Gabriel Jesus got injured. He's playing a bit part role, playing some Europa League games, play, uh, playing the EFL Cup game, whatever it was. But he's been sidelined in Premier League terms for most of the season. But I think, again, he's backed himself. Mikel Arteta, the consistency with which he's spoken about Arteta, you have to commend him for that. It isn't just a case that he is publicly bigging up a player to, you know, to talk him up ahead of a game when he needs him. You know, when you look back on what he said, he clearly meant it. What mm -hmm. he thought of Eddie, what he thought of his ability, what he thought of his ability to deliver at this level for this club, and not a club that's scratching around in mid-table now, a club that's going for the Premier League title. And I think what, what Eddie has done since he came into the team has been really, really impressive. He scored goals. Like you say, he scored these, these two in this big game when we needed our striker to deliver. He was there. He scored the goals. But I think every game, I think that yesterday was by far his best performance ever for Arsenal. By far. And he has been good. He was good in the derby. He was good against Newcastle. His all-round game week by week is improving the way he puts himself about. He ran Martinez and he ran Varane yesterday, two very, very good players. And he ran them around the Emirates and got stuck in and won tackles and won free kicks and held the ball up well. Like I love that bit late in the game where the ball came to him down the left-hand side. And I think 12 months ago, maybe 18 months ago, Eddie and Kedia is looking to make an impact and would go for goal in that scenario because he's he's desperate to make an impact and desperate to contribute to the team. He'd already made his contribution and he knew the best thing to do was just take the ball into the corner and just not waste time, but you know what I mean? Make it difficult for United to get that out of there. So there's a, there's a sort of an improvement in his decision-making right throughout his game. I think it's absolutely brilliant what he's doing. And look, I had my doubts, as I'm sure many people listening to this had doubts about Eddie and had doubts about his ability to 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 do what we want a centre forward to do in this Arsenal team. And if I had a humble pie in front of me right now, I would eat the whole lot of it. Fucking yeah. chapeau, Eddie and Kedia. I, I remember someone asked us um, who would be the second top goal scorer this season after oh, yeah. Jesus. And I, I think I said Eddie. But I'm honestly now thinking... There's a decent chance he, he'll end the season as Arsenal's top scorer full stop. I mean... Possible. You know, the, the rate he's scoring goals at. Um, at the finish on the third, listen, <laughs> he shows real dexterity to get a touch on that. It's mm -hmm. not straightforward. It's a really awkward height. And, uh, you know, I think it's arguably a pretty skillful finish. Also, we mentioned the Beautiful Game podcast. We should say... Uh, I think it was on in January, maybe when Arsenal entered the transfer window without signing a striker. Ian Wright came on the Arse cast and spoke about what an opportunity this presented. That's right. Eddie yeah, yeah, yeah. Way back when. And to be fair to him, he took it towards the end of that season, got the contract, and now he's, he's flying this season. And I know, I know you don't want to dwell on the numbers, but, you know, if you take the £100,000 a week figure, right, 52 weeks of that is... 
five point two million pounds a year. If that's a five million a five year contract, that's twenty six million pounds. If Arsenal had wanted to go out and buy a striker of this caliber, they would have had to spend that on a fee, minimum, at least. Be- at least before we even talk about the wage. So retaining Eddie was probably a half price deal compared to buying a new striker. And they absolutely got it right. Mm. They absolutely got it right. We did, we talked about this before, didn't we? Where we sort of said like, who, who would be um, the equivalent sort of striker that's coming into the Premier League at the kind of level where you're looking at like a second striker or your mm-hmm. backup striker, whatever it was. I think we mentioned Pats and Daka at right. Leicester as a sort of slightly analogous kind of uh, signing or player or the kind of player that people are saying, oh, you know, we should go for him, we should go for him, we should go for him. Um, I think we've got value. And also, separate to all that, on a purely kind of emotional side, as Mikel Arteta said in his press conference yesterday, Eddie has an Arsenal heart. And yesterday we beat Manchester United with three goals scored by players who graduated from the Hayland Academy. And yeah. that is part of the identity of the club. And I, I, yeah, I'm very grateful that it is. Yeah, fair play, fair play. Uh, I think it's your question. Okay. Um, I've got lots of questions. I've got lots of questions. Let me, oh, can I just ask you another one on this? Because oh, yeah, yeah. We, we did have like a ton of questions uh, like this one from uh, Gotem Batia on the Discord. Mm. Uh, has Eddie become undroppable? Will Arteta have to figure out how Enkedi and Jesus can play together rather than benching one for the other? And it's like, you know, I know there's a sort of, and I'm not being critical of anyone. Um, football is like that. There's a sort of short term, uh, short termism to the way we view things. When things are going well, it's like, well, how can it be any different? Uh, and, and things can change, obviously. But you know that that question of like what happens when Jesus is is fit again is quite an interesting one, isn't it? Because Eddie's going to make it a bit difficult. I don't think it's. Um, I think, you know, when, when Jesus is properly fit and they get him back in and they ease him back in, I think, you know, he will be the he will be the starter again. But it is a consideration, isn't it? Definitely. And he's thrown the gauntlet down to Jesus, particularly in terms of the rate at which he's putting the ball in the back of the net. Um, mm. I suppose the question is, you know, does everything else Jesus give you offset that? And I think we easily forget quite how brilliant Gabriel Jesus was as well in that first half of the season and what an integral part of the team. Mm-hmm. But, you know, this is a squad that requires depth and he's going to require more depth moving forward. And you need more than one striker. That's just a fact, you know. You need more than one striker. And Arsenal, it looks like I've got two. What what I would say is that, and I I almost hesitate to say this out loud, but Eddie's place in the squad right now is so critical. Like... If if we can't afford to lose Eddie at the yeah. same time, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. so like we need to do what we can to you know make sure this guy physically is protected because um, he's he has really stepped up to the plate to replace Gabriel Jesus, mm-hmm. uh, and if we were to not have Eddie, it would leave another gulf in our in our team and agree, our goal yeah, scoring yeah. options at this point in time. Um, I mean, because, yeah, we had a question uh, from Mini Shadow 5 about Eddie, which just said, what is Eddie's ceiling? Kid is out of this world. I mean, would you, I mean, do you have an answer to that? Like, how good can he be? Well, he's already better than I thought he was going to be, better than I expected. Mm -hmm. Um, So who knows? I mean, I don't quite know where his ceiling is. Um, he has obviously worked extremely hard, though. He's worked really hard to get the opportunities at this club and to take the opportunities as and when they're presented to him. So I don't know. I mean, I can't predict the future, but if he is changing people's expectations and altering their, their sort of what they think he's capable of, if he can do this, surely he can do more. But like I said, I, I, you know, I don't, 
I don't really know how to answer that um, other than, you know, I hope he just keeps improving and keeps scoring goals. There's no question that in the penalty box, he just fucking sniffs out chances. And there's mm-hmm. something... Not every player can do that. Not every striker yeah. can do that. And I think, you know, it was often leveled as a slight criticism of it, wasn't it? Uh, of him, rather. That this, you know, he's he's a penalty box player. Yeah, there was a kind of ongoing joke of the combined total distance of the goals he'd scored for Arsenal being yeah. about 10 feet or something like but, that. But I mean, how many, um, without wanting to give anyone flashbacks or anything like that, how many goals did Ruud van Nistelrooy score from outside the box? Fucking sure. none. None. Yeah. So there's sort of, there's a natural striker's ability that, you know, I'm sure you can coach into people or you can improve in people, but there's no question that he's got that. So... I suppose it really depends on how often he plays, how much football he plays and and how far he can push towards a first team place. But look, so far, so good. Yeah, I think he I think you're right. It's instinct for Eddie and you can do as much coaching as you like, but he's Mm. always had that knack. Um, And in a team that create as many chances as we do, that's particularly valuable. I'm sure if you go and put Eddie in Southampton's team, he's probably not going to look as good or score as many goals. Yeah. But he's kind of he's kind of ideal in some respects for where we are because we do get the ball in the box. We do play those dangerous cutbacks and he's just someone who's going to feed on that all day long. Mm. So, uh yeah, I'm thrilled for him. Thrilled mm. for him. Um I, I like this question from Zlatko Markovic. How long do you think uh, David De Gea will be out after that horror tackle from Eddie yesterday? I was just going to take a similar one from James Griver. Is that James Griver? He said, I was up all night worried about David De Gea's shoulder. The poor man could have died. That was very funny. <laughs> that was very funny. Nothing I did more say. more satisfying than seeing a, a goalkeeper who feigns injury. Absolutely. I did say it on the live blog as well. I said, oh, literally on the live blog, um, De Gea now rolling around on the floor like a shithead. What a fucking idiot. I hope he lets one in in the last second as punishment. And that was in the 87th minute on the live blog. So uh, that's um, my assist for Eddie and Kedia there. What about this? This is, uh, we had a lot of variations on this kind of question. Josh Moss on Twitter, who's at Mossman800, said, um, how would you approach Friday's game, the FA Cup tie, of course, that the Etihad? Is it a chance to beat City and create further belief or would you treat it separately and play players that need minutes and rest some for the Premier League games? It's a good question. Let me just quickly look at the um, the fixture list. And we've got a big old break in the Premier League now. But that's we, it. Yeah, I mean, we it's... don't play for a fortnight really until Everton away Saturday lunchtime on the fourth of February. So we've got Friday the twenty seventh. We're playing the FA Cup, and then Saturday the fourth. Yeah. So it's like well over a, like a full week to to recover i mean i think i would probably i think he will go strong Mm. i think he'll go strong i think like you might see like you might see Vieira, you might see trossard um start maybe matt turner you might see matt turner you might see you know, Tommy Asu start again. Uh, Tommy Asu and Tierney maybe start at fullback. Maybe depends if El Nenny is fit. If Partey starts, you know what I mean. But I think he, I think he will. I think he'll go stronger than people might like, and I think that is going to be true of however many cup games we have left this season. Really, because we had questions again. Um... You know, we had questions like, bah, bah, bah. people asking, oh, the chief, interested to hear your thoughts on the Europa League. The Europa League has always been a means to securing Champions League football. Mm. But with top four, you know, looking good and Arsenal our favourites for the Premier League, does that make the Europa League done? It's, I mean, it's a, um, it's, a, it's a trophy as well, though. It is a way to get into the, into the top four. But first and foremost, it's a European trophy. And look, I get it. Not the one that everyone wants to win, but still... A European trophy. I mean, I didn't mention Smith uh, Rowe. One of the stronger contenders, you would imagine, on form for that yeah. trophy. So I think the the reality of what we're going to do in the rest of this season is see strong teams with some rotation because I, I think we are, we are stronger um, 
than we might have been a, a few weeks ago because we've got Trossard, we've got um, Smith Rowe back, and you know we could still make another uh, signing or two before the end of of the window. So I think there will be some rotation, but I also think that people are going to say, "Oh, we should re-. like you can't go to Man City and rotate ten players. You just can't." They might rotate what three or four. Man City are going to pick a strong team against us because they only have strong teams. Well, this is it. You know? So the idea that we could go and play like, I don't know, uh, you know, completely rotated team just doesn't make any sense to me, even if it's the FA Cup, particularly as there is a week then between the the City game and the Everton game. I think let, it, let, me, let me rephrase it. Okay. Well, actually, first of all, do you agree with that? Like, what's your opinion about what we should do? Because as you know, I was very happy for everyone to share the FA Cup after the third round. Um, Even though some people pointed out that would mean Tottenham having a share in it too. Yeah, so that's true. Of, yeah. What Not do I think we should do? I think we should try and win as many games as possible. I do think there is something to... The, the manager's desire to create a winning mentality at the football club, regardless of the competition, regardless of how meaningful or otherwise people think certain competitions are, I think you've got to try, you've got to try and win games. Like if it's a game against Northampton Town, like rotate the bollocks out of it because that's possible. When it's a game against Manchester City, I don't know that you can. I think you have to obviously try and give some players minutes because you're going to need them in the Premier League. Like players like Vieira, like Smith Rowe, like Tierney, like Tommy Asu. You know, they're going to need some minutes, Trossard, etc. They're going to need minutes because when they're called upon in the Premier League, you don't want them coming in cold. Mm -hmm. So you've got to find the balance between that and a competitive team. But where is the, where is the fear? What is the fear about playing a strong team against Manchester City? Is it injuries? I guess. Is I it, guess, is but it also psychology, maybe? Yeah. You know, I think that so. thing of like, if we play our best team and we get beat heavily, what does that do? Yeah, but do you remember Arsene Wenger? Like, was it a. What game was it? Was it the. Was it the Carling Cup final or was it a semi final in the FA Cup or something? And he didn't play Andre Arshavin, maybe. I think it was an FA Cup semi-final. And he maybe. said, like, I wanted these young players to believe that they could go win the game. Yeah. Uh, well, you know. I don't, I don't know what game it was, but it was against Chelsea at yeah. Wembley. So I get the psychology of it, but also, like, play a team that can win a game, you know, rather than hang them out to dry. And I'm not saying that's what Arteta's going to do, but I think he, he will make some changes, but I don't think it will be quite as changed as people might like. Mm-hmm. It's going to be interesting, that's for sure. Yeah, and and what happens in the Europa League will depend on the draw as well. Depends who we get. If we get a relative minnow, if that makes sense, then you can you can rotate a bit more. Mm. But I mean, I, if, I, I think it's just going to go game by game where he's assessing the players, assessing who's available, assessing the caliber of the opposition and thinking about the best way to win the game with the players that he can. Yeah, and if it was up to me, probably I would err uh, more on the side of forget the cup competitions i'm really like oh, yeah uh, uh, that but, but it's not up to me and also that would be slightly counter to the culture that Mikel arteta has installed that has got us to this point yeah and i think that question or that that sort of outlook is often framed in the like would you give up the cup competitions if it meant that arsenal would guarantee to or were guaranteed to win the league well yeah yeah. Of course, but you can't make that guarantee. Nobody can make that guarantee. So I don't know. I don't know that you can approach it in that way. I understand. I understand. Let me ask you this one. Okay. Uh, Jakob Sloma Damsholt, who's at Damsholt on Twitter, said, Is it time to acknowledge that the Cronkies have done a great job since the hiring of Arteta? Hmm. <laughs> Cronky's done a great job. It's a it's it's a very interesting question, I think. It is. 
It is. And as you know, like I have a more, much more uh, tolerant position on the ownership than, and did maybe, uh, than many fans. Um, obviously, there was that slightly horrendous sort of almost breaking point with the Super League. Mm-hmm. I almost think it's a better question. No offense to the question because it is a good question, but like I almost think it's it's more relevant in some ways to say since that, because um, clearly that was a huge misstep, where which I think yeah will have broken some people's relationship with the owners, irre- you know, irrevocably. Um, it's hard to say because it's really hard to delineate responsibility. What I would say is that the, in broad terms, the people running the club, and if you want to include Josh and maybe to a lesser extent Stan in that, then I think that's absolutely fine, have done a very good job in terms of re-engaging the fans and reigniting uh, the team. Uh, I, I think that's kind of unquestionable and, and it's not been done purely on coaching. There has also been massive investment, which has been facilitated by the owners. Mm. Um, the mechanics of which, you know, are still a little vague in terms of, you know, we've had loans from... KSE and I know like the AST a concern for them is what are the repayment terms on that and that's all a bit in the dark I'm led to believe they're very favourable to the club and to be honest that would make sense that they are um, but I can't say that definitively yeah I, I, I think I, what I would say is, in in a, a league where I look a lot of the own, look at a lot of the owners and feel like, oh, I'm glad they're not our owner. Uh, I'm relatively, I've I've come to a place of relative comfort uh, with the Cronkies at the helm. Mm. If that makes any sense, it does. It does. I mean, look, there there have been criticisms and fully justified criticisms which have been made by others, and certainly I have uh, as well. Um, I think you're right to sort of make the Super League the line in the sand to an extent when it comes yeah, to I think that. Has to to be, that. I, it? If it's a teach, I don't know if it like ends up being a teachable moment for them or, or whatever. Um, like you said, it was a, a big mistake. I think you said misstep, um, but, you know, they they got that one wrong, as did the owners of, a lot of other clubs as well, let's not forget. But I think where where criticism is valid, I think it's also fair to point out that, you know, ultimately they are responsible for the people who run the football club. If those people are running it better, it's because they've been given the resources and they've been given the the the, the responsibility, the leeway, if that's the right way of putting it, to do it. And they're doing a good job right now. So um, the thing about it is nobody cares who owns a football club when you're winning, really. But of course, they have invested. They have provided funds to rebuild this squad. And that squad, that team is now top of the table in part because of, or in big part because of the way Mikel Arteta has assembled it and Edu has helped assemble it and, and the, the coaching he does and everything else. What he's what he's doing with these players is is absolutely first class. But the resources had to be there to bring those players in in the first place. So the financial backing that they have provided, however they have provided it, has helped the team get to where they are. So I do think they deserve um, some credit when things are going well. If they're getting criticized when things are not going particularly well, um, then they deserve some credit when things are going well. Um, yeah. Certainly and- when things were going less well, you know, people would say, well, ultimately the responsibility lies with yeah. the owners. Yeah. And so to be fair, you have to say the same the other way. I think that really Arsenal is run by, um, it's, it's, a, it's a group really of quite sort of dynamic young guys. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they've done extraordinarily well. Like I think keeping that intact 
You know, everyone talks about the potential sacking of Mikel Arteta, which was never really on the table, but sort of, you know, they had really had to stick by him in that difficult winter of mm. 2020. And obviously it was really important to retain him. But I think really it was about keeping that group who had a shared unified vision for where the club could go. And you would include Edu in that, you would include Vinay. And I think by extension, you would probably include Josh. Mm. Um, and I think... Uh, you know, they have played a big part in leading this revival. So, yeah, I, I, I think, right, this is a time when everyone at Arsenal is kind of getting their flowers. Um, yeah. And I don't know if uh, Cronkies will be sort of first on anyone's list, but I think the question raises a good and fair point. Yeah. Um, and I think you you only need to look further down the table to see what's happening on Merseyside, to see how it can go wrong with an owner that potentially could have been in charge at Arsenal. Yeah, so, well, that is, a, you know, a real sliding yeah. doors moment, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. If you look at Everton, and obviously that'll be our next game in the Premier League, slightly fearful they'll um, appoint a new manager by then and mm. get their house in order. Hopefully not. Um, but yes, that is kind of a... A, a real scary thought what might have been there yeah um hmm. what next i've got one from t dog he said how do you reflect on smith row not getting on as a sub yeah i just think that's speaks to a lack of fitness and as much you know when i think about the game for on friday and you know do we rest players i think one of the big questions is like who needs those minutes and I would say Smith he needs Rowe. some minutes in that game. Yeah. Because when else can we give them to him? Mm -hmm. um, unless we start dropping him down to play with the 23s or whatever, which I don't think well, they'll be that keen on or will help him that much get to the level that we we require. Mm. Um, 21s, I should have said around the 23s. I think he, he needs some time on the pitch. Yeah. Um, hopefully the cup provides that. What, yeah. what do you think? I, I agree with that. I think it is about minutes more than anything and who on the bench yesterday was better capable of getting into the rhythm of a very fast-paced game when we were really, really, really pushing. And I think Trossard, you know, is, is more match fit than Smith Rowe. And I think that's all it is. So um, he will get his he will get his minutes. I think he will start against Man City. Um, maybe on the left-hand side, it just means you've got Martinelli to come on if you want. If it doesn't go as well for Smith Rowe as you would like, but getting those minutes into him um, is, is really important. I thought this was quite an interesting one. It's not really a question, but I just wanted to make an observation. Um, Ringo Casey on the Discord talked about discipline. Four players that couldn't get yellow cards against Spurs or United. Four players that didn't get yellow cards. So many adm admirable parts of this team. I went back to have a look because I know Gabriel Jesus was one of those players. Yeah. Um, William Saliba was one of them. William Saliba's last yellow card, can you remember when it was? Was it Boxing Day? No. William Saliba's fourth yellow card of the season, at which point one more would have uh, handed him a suspension, was on the 16th of October wow. against Leeds, which is really quite something for a centre half to go, what is it, nine, ten games nearly? without picking up another booking? Because Saka's was against Brighton on the 31st of December. Right. That was his fourth. And so that's only three games. Saliba's gone nine or ten. So fair play. Yeah, he's managed that well. He's mm. managed that really smartly. Credit to uh, Kai Saka as well, who's managed to evade that. And uh, what is it now? The threshold moves to ten for those guys. Yeah. So they're safe for a while. Um, obviously, if yeah. you get to 10, I think it's a two-match ban, I think, rather than just mm. the one. Um, yeah. yeah. We're not into that territory yet. Aaron, uh, go on. Have you got one there? Sorry. No, no, no. I have got one, but if you've got one ready, go for it. Well, Aaron on the Discord said, when's the last time Arsenal had a soon-to-be signing sitting in the stands? I don't think I'd ever seen it until Kivior, Kivior, uh, today, he said. Um, yeah, so I don't Jakob know. Kivior. Um, Will Tord. Do you not remember Will Tord was in the, was in the crowd before he signed? He, he, he held up his jersey. Uh, with his name and number on it, I think, from the director's box. There um, you are, yeah. Inside. Well, that deal should be announced soon. And um, interesting, isn't it? You know, I mm. think Trossard was kind of 
a little bit outside of the classic recruitment strategy. Yeah, we didn't get a chance to talk about that. I mean, just very brief thoughts because we've sort of done it on a couple of podcasts. But, you know, um, as a a pivot from Mudrick to Trossard, um, anything you know, beyond it being a, a very sensible, um, very sensible move to make, given our sensible need and the, the, the timing yeah. of the signing. Sensible is the word, I think. Uh, I mean, I saw some of Madrid against Liverpool. He looked very lively, albeit he was up against James Milner and then later Trent Alexander-Arnold. I think he'll come up against uh, tougher right-backs in future. But uh, I think Trossard makes a good deal of sense and I was really impressed at the speed with which Arsenal mm. made that decision. And, you know, I think from contact first being made with Brighton, started on Wednesday, by Friday lunchtime, he was in the building and registered. Um, you know, having lost out on Madrid, we regrouped and made a very clear decision. And I think that was right. Mm-hmm. I, I thought it was interesting what Arteta said about, you know, we can do this now because we have... Uh, rejuvenated the squad. It's not the same as us bringing an ageing player into an ageing squad. We're just adding Mm. a bit of balance and diversity of experience. And I think a proven Premier League player who can hit the ground running, yeah, makes a ton of sense. I I don't think it's... um, I don't think it's the signing that, you know, everyone dreamed of necessarily, but I think it's eminently sensible. Yeah. I agree. Um, I but, agree. But 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 Kibios is someone who's more fitting with the the the, the sort of strategy, strategy, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, not really a deal that anyone was talking about, but a player Arsenal have watched for quite a long time. Uh, Twenty two, left footed centre back, mm-hmm. fills a spot in the squad, fills the squad out a bit. Sure. Um, I would imagine probably not going to play. If all goes well, probably not going to play a vast amount of football between now and the end of the season. But I think getting him in in January could be pretty helpful because next season, with any luck, we'll be fighting on four fronts, You know, one of which will be the Champions League and we'll, mm. need, we'll need more numbers. Yeah. Left-footed centre-half, who's versatile, can play in midfield a bit, can play at left-back mm-hmm. a bit. Uh, sounds very familiar. And the reliance, such as it is, on, on Gabriel has been quite big because he started 53 Premier League games in a row. Maybe it's 54 now. And on the one hand, that is a real testament to his consistency and durability and his importance to the team. But on the other you know, if you don't have a natural backup, we do have players who can play there, but we don't have somebody who who sort of fills in in that role. I mean, I'm hoping in a way that it's kind of like the Ben White, Tommy Asu situation at um, at right back, like that mm. quality alternative rather than backup. If you know what I mean, uh, to have that in another position can only be positive. Yeah. Absolutely, and uh, it's, you know, I don't know if you saw this morning, but there's reports. Um, one of my colleagues at the Athletic has reported that uh, it's down to Arsenal and Dortmund now mm. for Fresneda, uh, the Valladolid right back. That would be a loan back to Valladolid until the end of the season. He's only 18, but mm-hmm. it's encouraging, I think, to know how much work goes on in the background. You know, we were all so fixated on Mudrick and talking about that. And then, bang, you know, the Kiwi All signing comes out of nowhere. And as good as the reporting around Arsenal is, there's a lot of work going on that we don't know about. And Mm. similarly, the Declan Rice story comes out, you know, and that's something that Arsenal have been talking about and planning for quite some time. Um, Yeah, I just think it's reassuring. Yeah. There's much more happening than what we are aware of. And and the squad building continues. And if you're a young player and you're not, politically strong aren't into going somewhere you don't want to go why wouldn't you choose Arsenal yeah exactly I think I think that Arsenal Dortmund one is interesting just because Dortmund have such an outstanding reputation for mm. player opportunity and player development but uh, I think a pitch from Mikel Arteta has persuaded a lot of players in the past and you know it could be pretty convincing in this situation yeah. so fingers crossed because he, he looks a real player actually from what I've seen um I had a question which is sort of more a gateway to a conversation, but uh, it's from Call Me Joey on the Discord. And okay, Joey Joe. says, um, 
A very, very good morning, gents. Would you consider starting Trossard on the left against Everton? I think Martinelli's, Martinelli's performances have dropped slightly after the World Cup. And Trossard looks sharp, even though it's a brief cameo. And the reason I, ra- I raised this is because where I was sat yesterday in block six, um, there was a fair bit of in-ground frustration at Gabriel Martinelli at times. I think mm-hmm. it's not a consensus, but from some individuals. And I've seen and heard some debate about his recent performances. So I just wondered kind of where you think he's at and if you would consider, you know, taking him out of the team anytime soon. I think the the arrival of Trossard allows you to do that if you want. And I, I would I would not disagree with anyone who had a few concerns about Martinelli's post World Cup form. Because I think going into the World Cup, he was on fire. Since then, he hasn't quite been at the the same level. Um, and we forget as well, he's still a young player. He's only 21. Form is going to fluctuate. He's going to have games and maybe periods in a season where, where it doesn't go well for him. Um, and I think maybe this is one of those periods. But what we haven't had this season is anyone to fill in. We haven't had anyone to fall back on. We haven't had any real competition for him. Smith Rowe has been injured the whole season and Trossard has only just arrived. So there's been a reliance on Martinelli to play and to deliver from that left-hand side. Um, And I'm not saying it's unfair or anything like that, but I think it's positive now that potentially you know, this weekend uh, or when we go to Man City, you could play Smith Rowe on the left or you could play Trossard on the left. Um, If they play well, maybe they come into the the frame for Everton. I mean, if we're talking about it and people in the ground are talking about it, you can be quite sure that Mikel Arteta and his staff are noticing it as well, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And again, it's it's not to be critical of him but it's normal for form to fluctuate. It's normal for a player to to sort of have peaks and troughs in their season, unless they're just ridiculously consistent, particularly when it comes to attacking players. So I would have no objection to somebody else getting a go for a few games, because I think maybe there could be a an element of fatigue to Martinelli because of how much he's played, how often he's played this season, he went to the World Cup, he's come back, he's straight back in the team, he's off again, and for the most part, he plays 90 minutes every game. He doesn't get a rest. Mm. Um, so if we've got other options, by all means, use them. What, what do you think? I think maybe fatigue could be a factor. You know, he's a player who, I don't want to say relies on explosiveness, but it's a big part of his arsenal. Um mm. I'm not as worried about his performances as some, I would say. I think that uh, I spoke about intention earlier and his intention is always positive, Mm -hmm. he's a threat. And I think as well, we analyse these games always from our club perspective. And in this recent run, he, he came up against Kieran Trippier and had a very, I thought, I thought Trippier won that battle. But as much as we might not like to acknowledge it, Trippier is arguably the informed player in the best defence in the league. Mm. And he's often left in one-on-one situations, Martinelli. You know, he's not uh, someone who always has an overlapping player. In That's Chenko, true. At time he's tucked inside. Similarly, I thought uh, yesterday, I know that wan has his limitations going forward, but I think he's an excellent one-to-one defender. And... I thought he marshaled Martinelli very effectively. I mean, it, you know, in a duel, he's really, really good. You saw that at Crystal Palace in the week as well, where he made an outstanding late tackle on Wilfred Zaha. Mm. Um, so I think he's been he's come up against some really tough opponents on that flank. And I think as well, another component potentially is, I think he misses Gabriel Jesus a little. I think they had a fantastic understanding. Yeah. And... Jesus would drift out to that flank. They'd interchange a bit. There was a real natural kind of 
rhythm and intuition between those two that's not quite there with Eddie in the same way. I think Eddie feels almost more on the same wavelength as Saka at times. Um, so th there are little factors here and there, but I'm hopeful that a bit of rest, a bit of competition will see him return to his best. I still think that uh, he's in the midst of a, a really strong season and I would back him you know, to return to, to productivity before too long. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I think, you know, he has been fantastic. Uh, but I think it's good now that we have players who can give him a rest, give him a push, add depth to the squad. And we saw the benefit of that yesterday when Martinelli came off, Trossard came on, Trossard's involved in the in the winning goal. Brilliant. Can't ask for more. So let's do a couple of quick ones just to finish off here. Um we had one here on the Discord. Comes from Domo. He said, Oi, I saw James at the pub after the game, and I asked him if he was optimistic about our title chance. I said I was optimistic, which he said was the right word to describe how he was feeling. So I'm desperate to know in the cold light of day whether he thinks we'll win the league or not. I'd also like to know how his taco home was and whether he asked to play his own music, and if so, what the song choice was. Thanks for the hug, big boy, XXX. And not Taco, he since corrected that to Uber. So I was a bit concerned about you jumping in a giant Taco and, and making your way home. But <laughs> I'd love to. Yeah, that'd be amazing. So, uh, Well, what uh, optimism is the right word. You know, I'm hopeful mm. uh, and confident, but I'm uncertain. You know, how sure. can any of us be certain? Exactly. But, I do believe. As for the taxi, I actually meant to tell you about that. So I got in this taxi and the guy was raging. He was so cross. Man United fan? No, not a football fan. And, what was he uh, so angry about? He was uh, a South Asian guy and uh, he was shouting about the football. And he was going, I don't believe it. Monday football, Tuesday football, Wednesday football, Thursday football, Friday football, Saturday football, Sunday football, everyday football. We just had the World Cup. Why football every day? I can't drive in this city. I can't drive here. I can't drive there. Why football? And then uh, he goes, you know, every day people go to the football. They give their money to the club. They buy the beer. They buy the ticket. The club takes the money. And Why? What do they get in return? 30 years they go to that club. What does the club give them? <laughs> what does the club give them? He was so angry. Did um, you have any answers for him or did you just decide silence is the best? No, I just said to him, well, you're right. You know, in some respects, it is a kind of crazy labor to commit yourself to a football club and pump money in and buy tickets and give up your time. But in return, you get days like yesterday. Mm. And, you know, I explained to him, I was like, for 90 minutes, I wasn't thinking about anything else in my life. You know, no worries, no stress. I was completely captivated by that game. And the elation that I felt, as I spoke to you at the start, that kind of spiritual almost mm. experience, I was like, to me, that's worth it. And he sort of uh, grumbled a bit and said how he prefers going to restaurants. And I said, well, I like restaurants too. but To I'm each honest. their own. To each their own. You don't have to go to the football. You don't have to go to the I said to him, listen, you don't have to go to football. I'm sorry about the traffic. It is on a lot of days. If it was up to me, it would all be Saturday, 3 p.m. and, you know, maybe a Wednesday night, but that's not the world we live in anymore. Mm. And, uh, yeah, he was very cross. But it did make me reflect and think it is a big sacrifice following your team. And I, I spoke to people after the game. We were talking about the demand for tickets, you know. I've yeah. never in my life had so many people asking me if I can get them tickets to games. And I'm so sorry, guys. It's like I can't. Like, it's so difficult to get tickets at the moment. And people go say to people, you're so lucky to have tickets to watch Arsenal right now. And they're right. But some of those people who are going to these Arsenal games week in, week out, have been going and paying for mm -hmm. 10 20 years and it's not always been great and it's not some of them longer 
And it's not always been great and it's not always been good. Yeah, yeah. But you reap the rewards days like yesterday and it makes it all worthwhile. So my taxi home was uh, loud and eventful, but also, you know, brought me to that epiphany of like, well, this is why we do it. This is why we follow the club, yeah. because we get to enjoy these moments afterwards. Within the sort of community that you exist in, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's part of it as well. Did you get a taco? You didn't get a taco? No taco, sadly. No I do love tacos as well. Love me a taco. Okay, final one from Damien Joyce, who's at Gunnar Damo JJ24. He says, my two-year-old parrot or son, whichever suits, has a great habit of only choosing certain words from my footy-watching vocabulary. His top three at the moment are, move the ball. He just says, move. <laughs> Arg And cunt. <laughs> What would be your top three repeated phrases? And I thought of this question because I was watching at you. I was watching you in your video in the in the final mm. stages of the game, and there were certain things that you said mm. that feel like stock football phrases. Yeah, cliches. I mean, I guess I, you know, I don't know is one of my classic catchphrases. I imagine a parrot would uh, pick that up of me pretty quickly. But, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, Sinchenko. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, Sinchenko. What are you doing? <laughs> what would yours be? Do you know? I think I'm very much a like a come on. Yeah, come on. You can't get away. You can't from really on. get away from come on. I will admit to throwing out the odd cunt. Um, I, I, the Arsenal players enjoy and staff enjoy a vamos, don't they? I don't well, know if you can do. pick that up. They do. Yeah. There was a huddle at the end of. Um, there was a huddle at the end of the game, and. I don't know which one it was, whether it was Carlos Cuesta or or the other guy. I think it was guy. Miguel Molina. Actually, Miguel I Molina, think. the other sort of um, same initial guy. Yeah, the other one. The yeah, other Carlos one. Cuesta, Miguel Molina. I think it was Miguel Molina who came in and they were all having a bit of a hug, you know, um, Miguel and Big Al, Big Al Stivenberg and Nicholas Yover and everything else. And Miguel Molina came in at the end and there was a real like, vamos! Mm. Um, which was, you know... Um, a stock phrase when I played football in, in Spain. Yeah, well, I, I think one. Mikel gives it a big vamos after goals sometimes. He certainly did in North London Derby. Yeah. I even noticed... Some of the English players do it as well, though. Was yeah. it Smith Rowe in a video? Shaka was as well, yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah. with the vamos. They all so. love a good vamos. Yeah, it's... Uh... Luther vamos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they love a vamos, so yeah. Love a good Mikel vamos. had a parrot. Uh, the other day I was, in a, I was in a cafe where I live in Muswell Hill... Um, like a little calf having like I don't know what I was having a baked potato and a coffee or something a baked um, a potato there and a, a parrot coffee. on his shoulder hang a on a big parrot a, right a yeah. baked potato and a coffee I can't remember Andrew maybe it was an omelette and a coffee right, it was an okay, omelette fair enough. it was an omelette All right, is that that's, acceptable yeah that's fine that's, that's fine but there was a bloke in there with a parrot sitting yeah. on his shoulder I, I think, uh, don't it, think it, I'd like that he was chatting away to the owner. The parrot had, or the, the, the guy? No, the, the owner. <laughs> the, the owner of the parrot was chatting to the owner of the calf. Right. Um, and he just had a parrot sat on his shoulder the whole time. And I was just two tables away. And this parrot was sort of looking at me. No. Uh, eyeing my omelette. No, 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 no. I would not, I would not be into that at all. Like birds inside? Yeah. Terrifying. Flapping around. Terrifying to me. Could not... Could not possibly deal with that. I'd have to get mine as, you know, a takeaway, and then I'd never darken the door of that place again. Because what if you go in one day and there's a fucking ostrich in there? Well, that's the guy what I'm with his next. Fucking ostrich or a griffin or something. You'd be like, no, where is this going to end? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just want a baked potato. Why is there a griffin? Yeah. Yeah. Why, why are my intestines on the floor? Because the fucking razor sharp talon of this griffin has just fucking eviscerated me. I didn't come into this cafe for that. I didn't read the TripAdvisor before I went in. Maybe there's yeah. a lot of complaints about big, scary bird-like <laughs> creatures. Yeah, watch out. Mythical, deadly birds exist in this cafe. Coffee's good, exactly. though. 
Oh, coffee's great. Coffee's good. All right. Look, we better leave it there because um, we need to get this out yeah, for people to listen people. to. The people want it. You know what, though? we did. You did mention um, Ian Wright and oh, yeah. Eddie and Keddie on a podcast. Maybe I should talk to him again, see what he thinks of Eddie now. I'll see if I can make that happen. I'll see okay. if I can make that happen for people. All right. We'll cross up. We'll cross our fingers. We will cross our fingers. Uh, to everybody, thank you so much as always uh, for being here and for listening. A jolly chapeau and a vamos to all of you. Um, we'll catch you on the next one. Vamos! Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.